We are fortunate to have here Dean Aldemaro Romero, <laughs> Dean of the Weissman School, to present his research on diversity as a toolbox for success. Dean Romero received his first degree in biology from the University of Barcelona, Spain, and his PhD in biology from the University of Miami. He has published more than 900 pieces, including 17 books and hundreds of articles, many of them on the issues of diversity in academia. He's currently the chair of the Committee on Cultural Diversity of the Council of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Dean and the Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the International Council of Fine Arts. <coughs> As an administrator, he has a record of successfully leading efforts in diversification and internal internalization. Faculty, students, and staff, and I can personally attest to that. Um, so thank you very much for presenting your research, and we are looking forward to hearing you talk. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, for coming to this presentation. This is an idea that began about six months ago, as Mona mentioned, when uh, I was discussing some of these topics with uh, her predecessor, Kieran Morrow. And what I'm going to do today, basically, is to bring up some of the issues that are being coming up constantly regarding the issue of diversity in a very broad spectrum. I will began my introduction by giving you the basic idea that everybody have in mind when they first approach the issue of diversity, and it's the issue of social justice. Uh, when it comes to higher education, this is something that began in the 1960s, uh, where a number of uh, faculty and students were demanding that there was more uh, diversity representation in those institutions. And a very hot point of that uh, development was what happened in Cornell University in 1969 when a group of uh, students, uh, as you can see there, uh, got armed themselves with rifles, uh, shotguns, bandoliers, and all the things, demanding that the institution became much more diversified. And that was something that was very strong in those years, and a number of the, especially Ivy League institutions, uh, created specific departments uh, uh, dealing with these issues, Black and Latino studies, and, and that sort of things. Uh, by the same token, uh, because of that, this particular picture that won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for News Photography in 1970 alarmed a number of individuals and organizations on the conservative side, and they decided to do something about this. And specifically, John Olling, who was a alum of Cornell University, created the first organization in order to fight back anything that had to deal with diversity in higher education. And they have been followed by other institutions uh, to today's uh, world. In fact, we can see that many institutions of higher education now have been receiving funding for a number of these type of organizations that they are creating a special chairs or departments specifically to deal with the other side, as they say, of diversity. In fact, they call this a strategy Beach Heads Strategy. Because of this, the fight has been taken also to the courts. Because sometimes we think that from the legal viewpoint, we can enforce the laws in order to make places more diverse. But one of the most recent cases has to be with Abigail Fisher against the University of um, uh, Texas, where basically this is a case in which she was uh, contending that diversity shouldn't be taking place should have a place in the consideration of admitting students. And this case was so well funded and so hardly fought that this is the only case in history that went twice to the Supreme Court. Twice. And she got all that. And although many liberals thought that this would be a victory, could be a good one because basically the Supreme Court will reassert the idea of quotas in higher education. Uh, the Supreme Court disagreed, but they stated that diversity had 
a role to be played in higher education. So that was, in many ways, a victory for that happen. Now, so you can see, this is a complicated a story and a contentious one in many ways. But I wanted to take a different look at all this problem. It's a scientific view. In other words, how we can look at diversity as a something that really uh, promotes uh, or something positive institutional higher education. And this is come from my background. I am a scientist. <laughs> And this picture taken by one of my students in uh, one of my field trips uh, to, to the Caribbean, to Barbados, by the way, um, uh, explains pretty much what I am. But if you think about it, this, to prove from a scientific viewpoint that diversity is good is a big statement. It's a big task. And that reminds me of another scientist who once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, Carl Sagan. The way we approach in science things is by stating a hypothesis that we try to prove or refute. And we call this a nil hypothesis, meaning that we are not presuming anything until we get some proof of that. And that's why we began with a, a statement that basically says nothing is going to change. Diversity does not improve the effectiveness of organization. So the task here is to find the evidence that will counter that very hypothesis, that new hypothesis. And that's what this presentation is all about. To, pre to give you uh, all the information that I have been able to gather in the last few years regarding diversity, to see diversity as a toolbox for success, and to present to you the evidence that has been gathered during the last few years. And at the end, I will uh, mention some of my colleagues who have been very helpful in uh, helping me to get um, all this information together. The outline of my presentation is going to be first, I'm going to talk about the sources from which I have been gathered all this information, some definitions, because I think there are many different understandings of what diversity is at many different levels. I'll be talking about a mathematics theorem that is supporting this idea. But don't be afraid, I won't be showing you too many formulas or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, the hypothesis testing of the uh, hypothesis I just mentioned earlier, and then a set of conclusions. In terms of sources, uh, all the information came from peer review papers, from academic books, but also from some of the classified US government documents, to which I have access in the last few weeks. So let's begin with definitions. When we talk about diversity, we need to have a very broad mind of what diversity means. The first thing that comes to our mind is, okay, we're talking about ethnic diversity or racial diversity. But there is much more than that. I'm going to explain why this is important to understanding in a much broader sense. There are two types of diversity, and that's what we call two, uh, dimensional diversity. The inherent diversity. What do we mean by that? is the things that are attached to us because we were either born with that or because of our very early experiences, they impacted us. Gender, ethnicity, national origin, age, sexual orientation, disability, religious background. You may be an atheist today, but if you were born in a Southern Baptist environment, you're going to have certain impressions of that view of the world from that point of view. And socioeconomic background. You may be well off today, but obviously, if you were born and raised in a poor environment, that also will have an influence on the way you see the world. So that is inherit diversity. But there's another one called acquire diversity. And that includes a panoply of different things that are the kind of things that you experience as an adolescent and later as an adult. Cultural fluency, generational savviness, gender smart, social media skills, cross-functional knowledge, global mindset, language skills, and military experience. These are the kind of things that, because you experience them learning on, la on life, has nothing to do really exactly or necessarily with um, formal education, but the kind of experiences that makes you a much more uh, savvy person when it comes uh, about the world that surrounds you and the kind of problems that you're going to be facing. And this is important to take into consideration because imagine that we at Baruch had an engineering school. And then we have these four 
bright, white engineers who graduated from Georgia Tech, one of the prime engineering institutions in this country. And then we say, oh, we have the opportunity to hire someone to increase diversity. This is a person who also graduated from Georgia Tech, who came from also middle class, is not a first generation person, but he happens to be black. If you think a little about it, then you're not adding too much diversity there because you're having a person that, despite the different color of the skin, has had a totally different experience, very much similar to the people you already have in there. And I'm going to get back to this point because I think this is very important in my presentation today. These things obviously have an influence when it comes to the decisions that you make when hiring people, okay? The things at the top of the pyramid that you see there are things that we can e easily recognize when interviewing people for a position. Age, culture, gender, nationality, ethnicity, race, mental, physical status. These are things that are pretty visible. And although we are not forbidden by law to take these things into consideration, they are there and we get to see them when it comes to the interview process. There are others that may be visible or invisible, veteran status, sexual orientation, uh, religion. Uh, during all the interviews that I have conducted since I got here to Baruch, I was amazed to see how many people volunteer this kind of information during the interview process. And then there are the, the invisible ones, family status, education, but I don't, I don't mean formal education, but I mean the type of cultural education that you have, perspectives, socioeconomic status, life experiences, those things are more, much more invisible, but they are there. Then it comes these notions that we have about people, how prepared they are for a particular job. And one typical measure of this is IQ. We all know that IQ is a very bad way to identify an individual because they are very culturally biased tests of people, okay? I'm going to give you some examples of that. The other thing is, when it comes to IQ, remember that intelligence is not additive. You may have 134, I may have 122. If we count all the people in this room with your IQs, let's say, uh, 12, uh, uh, 120, you said there are about 125 people here, the IQ of this room is not 10,655. <laughs> I mean, this doesn't work that way, okay? So let's dispel that. And also sometimes we box people in terms when it comes to opportunities in education to GPAs and SITs, which have been proven many times they are not a good predictor necessarily of the success of a particular study. Let me give you an example that came up just last year of this, um, female student who graduated a bachelor's degree at the 14 from Chicago State University. This student had SATs and GPAs below the admission standards, but because her mother was studying there and she insisted that she, this, this, this kid is, was gonna make it, give an opportunity, the opportunity was given and she graduated with a bachelor's degree at 14. So be careful with these numbers because we cannot box people into numbers. Things are much more complicated than that, okay? Why is this important? It's important because the kind of things we are dealing with today require different perspectives in order to be solved. I love this particular cartoon where you see an elephant, and different people, depending upon their background, are going to see different things in the same animal. A person who works in the textile industry may see a rope, Another who is a forestry engineer will see a tree. A zoologist will see a snake. And uh, someone in the war department will see a spear. You name it. We all see things differently because it depends upon our own perspective based on our own background. Let's take, for example, New York City. I'm going to show you four different maps of New York City, the same maps. In this case, you have a foreign-born zip code distribution of people uh, in the city, in the five boroughs. And you can see that this is the kind of things that will interest people at Homeland Security. People when it comes to immigration studies, these are the type of things they will be very interested in looking at. However, 
A sociologist may be more interested in looking at that the same foreign born by neighborhood, because that has a different connotation of what that means in terms of the human relations that happen there. Then a linguist may be interested in looking at New York as where are the most spoken second languages in the cities. And that person will find something like this. The same map, different perspective. And someone who is an entrepreneur <laughs> and wants to establish a pizza uh, uh, outlet will see where the competition is. And that is the map that that person is going to look at when it comes to that kind of things. So we can see the same thing with totally different perspectives depending upon our interests and background. So an idea that has really taken me uh, with great interest is one something that was proposed by Scotty Page of uh, the University of Michigan, that he says that we should be looking at people as toolboxes. What do we mean by that? Imagine that here in the vertical campus, all the technicians has one, only one toolbox. The same toolbox with the same tools in there. Well, if they are electricians, they will solve electrical problems. If they are plumbers, they will solve sewage problems or water problems, and so on. But the fact of the matter is to manage a building like this, so complex with so many things, you need many different people with many different toolboxes to approach that. And that's what I like of this particular approach. And what we mean by that is a toolbox is a compendium of different things <coughs> that we all humans have. In terms of knowledge, what we know in terms of facts, experiences, processes that we know how they work. In terms of perspectives, is how we map the reality in our internal language, the example I gave you for New York City earlier. And in terms of heuristics, how we are going to search for a solution to those problems. So people will come up with saying, OK, uh, let's study this problem from a mathematical viewpoint, or from a qualitative viewpoint, from a sociological viewpoint, and try to find a solution to that. So that's basically what we mean by these toolboxes that we all have. And this is important because the kind of problems we have been facing in society have been changing dramatically in the last century. At the turn of the 20th century, most works were simple, monotonous. This is a picture taken in the year 1900, in which you can see a lot of kids who were basically sorting out pieces of coal. You didn't have to have any education to that. Your background was totally irrelevant, because you were being used as machines. Do this. And you can see there the uh, foreman with a cane making sure that the process was going to be as efficient as possible. So most of the jobs around that time were of that nature. As the century progressed, we got into more and more complicated systems. This is Saturn V. This is the rocket that took humans to the moon for the first time. It had three million components. Most of them were backup components because all this technology was so new that they needed to make sure it was going to explode. It wasn't going to explode. And in some cases, they did. Okay? But now you have seen, for example, in the uh, last few days, how a SpaceX a private company is now preparing, sending people to the moon with much more simplified systems, reusing many of the parts. So these things have become much simpler. The real serious problems that we are facing today are called complex problems. Example, if you are being told we have an obesity problem, the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh, stop eating and exercise more, right? That's the normal response. But if you really take a look in depth of the problem, you're going to see how complicated it is. It has to do with food, produ food production, the quality of that food, had to do with food consumption, how we consume things, so these are people who have different expertise dealing with this particular side of the problem. Individual physiology, not everybody responds the same way to what we ingest. 
has to be with physiology in general of the human body. It also has to do with physical activity and the environment in which we are found. In general, for example, uh, I come to um, Baruch to work every day by walking 20 minutes from Penn Station and then 20 minutes back. That's part of the environment in which I live. And that helps me to, to be a little bit fitter. But if it's not, I will have to do a lot of exercise for by myself. It's called what it's called individual physical activity. And then we have individual psychology. Some people have psychological issues when it comes to food consumption. And then social psychology. The people around us, what they eat, how they influence our decisions. So you can see this is a very complex problem that requires many different people with many different toolboxes to try to solve it. In a recent classified document from the National Security Agency, this is the problem in Afghanistan. It is not just sending the Marines that you're going to solve these problems. You can see how our issues have to do with coalition, a coalition capacity of priorities, coalition domestic support, tribal governance, overall government capacity, central government, uh, tactical issues with the, uh, uh, Air Force, uh, with the armed forces, population conditions and belief, infrastructure and services of the economy, popular support, narcotics, you name it. This is why when politicians offer you a simple solution to these problems, try again. <laughs> Not only that, a part of this map that hasn't been declassified yet is the money that is flowing in order to maintain this system. Millions of dollars every year in something that the economists call a sunk of, uh, uh, some fallacy. The idea that by putting more money you're going to solve a problem. Remember Vietnam? That's why these problems are so complex that more and more of the academic papers that are published every year have more and more co-authors. Because you need more and more people to help you to figure out every point of your problem that you are assessing. This is a projection of the, it's not so good here, it's better on the, on the electronic screens there, of the average of authors for, scientific, for uh, academic papers from early in this century, it was one, there were rarely any, anything that was co-authored, to the present time, which nearly is um, almost six co-authors per paper. In fact, there are some papers in science, in, especially in the area of cosmology, that have over 200 co-authors. And that has made very complicated uh, the life for many of us in academia when we're trying to judge what is the contribution of a particular author in a particular uh, moment in their tenure uh, and promotion process. But this is a good indication of how things are becoming more and more complicated. So let me try to tell you how these things have been seen by th different people in the past. A mathematical theorem, basically just to refresh you a little bit your memory, is this a statement in which based on certain axioms and cer certain ideas, you are going to prove something that's going to happen in certain ways, okay? And all this began with a scientist called Francis Galton at the end of the 19th century. He was half cousin of Charles Darwin, and he was an, the founder of statistics. All the statistics are based on the work that this British scientist did. And because he was always thinking of number, in 1907, he published in Nature a paper saying, I found out something that I cannot explain. And this problem be, be, uh, went to be known as Galton's steer. This was the steer. <laughs> because the year before, he attended the Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition in England. And then he said, let me just make an experiment here and ask everybody I can see, none of them expert on cattle, to calculate the weight of this steer. After he asked people to give them their estimation, he made an average and found out the weight was 1,187 pounds. Then he went to the people in the, um, in the exhibition and said, I want you to weight this animal for me. And the weight was 1,000 
198 pounds. He said, how all these people who have no expertise get it so precise to this thing? And he started calling this the wisdom of crowds, which is actually the title of a book by James Sorowicki, in which he presents not only this example, but many other examples that show when a large segment of the population with very diverse background and with no specific knowledge on, the, on, the, on a particular problem, get it right by just a margin of 3%. So this was a big mystery. How on earth these things that are, these humans who are not computers can get it right? And the solution came in a paper that was published in 2004 uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Lu Hong and Stevie, uh, Scotty uh, Page, in which they look at the problem from a mathematical viewpoint, trying to figure it out, and came out with a solution. The solution was the diversity prediction theory. Oh, don't, don't, don't get scared. <laughs> don't, don't get scared. It's the only formula I'm going to show today. But actually, it's a very simple one. What this formula says is that the failure of the crowd, that is, how far are you from guessing something as an entire group, is equal at the average, individual average of each one of us assessing something, and here is the important thing, minus diversity. To put it in very simple terms, the more diverse the people involved in a problem, the better chances that you get it right. I mean, this was astonishing, that they came up with this particular uh, mathematical theorem for this particular problem. The conclusion was the diverse group almost always outperforms the group of the best by a substantial margin. And that's something that is very well explained in his book, The Difference, which, by the way, has been a tremendous help for me. And I have had a lot of conversation with Scotty Page about this and many other issues. Let me give you some examples. Pearl Harbor. There were many people who told the central command, this is going to happen. And the Joint Chief of Staff said, no, can be. The Japanese don't have torpedoes that can go in such a, a shorter, uh, 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 shallow uh, depth in, in Pearl Harbor to attack our planes. No, that can happen. People at radars, there were radars at that time in Pearl Harbor. They were saying, there's something coming here. But there were this group of people who basically have this very uniform view of the war saying, it's not going to happen. And then a day that has lived in infamy since then. Then we have the case of Bay of Peaks, a plan that was inherited by the Kennedy administration from the previous Eisenhower administration, and uh, all put together by the CIA, the same group of people with the same education saying, let's go it and then Castro will fall down from that uh, operation. Wrong. And then we had 9-11. Many people have predicted that 9-11 was going to happen. In fact, there have been documents that have been declassified by the US government, basically stating very clearly, Bin Laden determined to strike in US and pointing to the World Trade Center as the main objective. Why? Because they tried before. <coughs> Remember the cars in the, in the parking lots? They were obsessed with that. But at that time, the government said, no, that's not going to happen. Impossible. So they didn't listen to the dissenting voice. This is something that was actually uh, explained very well by a Yale social psychologist called Irving Janis who in his 1972 book titled Victims of Groupthink explained this as follow. Group thinking, a type of thought within a deeply cohesive in-group whose members try to minimize conflict and reach consensus without critical testing, analyzing, and evaluating ideas. Basically, if you have in a group, in a room, a lot of people, maybe very bright, but they all think alike, that's going to happen. This is during the missile, Cuban Missile Crisis, 
When the missiles were discovered by the U-2 photographs, President Kennedy met with the Joint Chief of Staff and said, what do we do here? Their mentality was, let's invade Cuba. Let's take these missiles out of there. In fact, Cortes LeMay, who was the Chief of Staff for the Air Force, coined a famous phrase, let's then bomb that back to the Stone Age. That was the mentality. Kennedy got scared. This is the same people who told me we should be doing the Bay of Pigs invasion. I need to get a different idea about this. So he asked his brother Bobby to get with what's called the XCOM, Executive Committee, to discuss alternative other than bombing back to the Stone Age. How can we solve that? And he said, I don't want to even be present in those meetings so they don't feel influenced by me by trying to tell me what they think I want to hear. So the XCOM got together, had a number of meetings, and they came up with a, a different alternative, which was a blockade of Cuba. Of course, they didn't call it blockade because in diplomatic terms, blockade is an act of war. So they call it a quarantine. Okay? And thanks to them, I think many of us are here today. Because as was discovered after the fall of the, uh, um, the Soviet Union, there were already tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba. And the local commanders had the orders that in case that the US attack or invade Cuba, they were going to use that. And then Kennedy will have any other uh, recourse but to respond likewise against the Soviet Union, as he had promised in a, in a televised speech. We can see the same kind of mistakes being made with other things. This explosion of the uh, uh, Challenger uh, um, uh, shuttle in uh, 1986. There have been many warnings from many people outside this cadre of the leadership in NASA saying, don't do it, this is dangerous, this is not the best condition to, for this to happen, and that's what happened. And since we don't, we don't seem to learn from history, exactly it's happened the same thing with the shuttle Columbia in 2003. And there have been books written about this, how bad decisions were made because they, weren't, they didn't allow a different point of view, a diversity of input into that. And we saw that just happening last year. Remember all the polls? Trump, ha, that's a joke. Never win. Hillary, all the way. And because they started to, they didn't want to miss the train, they, all these polling organizations started to imitate themselves in terms of the approach and methodology they were using. They were doing something that's called sacrificing accuracy to save face. So we don't look different from the others. As the writer and expert in foreign affairs, Walter Liebman, once said, when all things alike, no one thinks very much. And this actually has a parallelism in nature. William Beebe, a zoologist at the New York Zoological Society, discovered in the tropics uh, in the 1920s a very interesting phenomenon. He saw these long lines of army ants following each other. But when one army ant got lost, because they are, happened to be blind, by the way, they were following the chemical trails of all the others and they started to go around without being able to find their nest. Oops. And what they actually saw happening was this. All going in circles that became more and more concentrated because they were following other blind uh, organisms that they thought they knew what they were doing, but actually they didn't. And in fact, let me see if I can get to here. At the end, you see this big concentration of army ants getting into a smaller and a smaller spa spaces with the ones dying right in the middle until every single one, single one dies. And this is what happened to the reputation of the polling uh, companies last year, on November the 9th. So don't try to imitate everyone else. <laughs> Some of you may think, well, this may happen in human affairs, human things. 
You can never have any enzymes. Wrong. This individual here is Mendel, the founder of genetics. This is a guy who was born in a very poor family in what is today Austria, I mean Czechoslovakia, uh, the Czech Republic. And because he was very poor and he couldn't afford an education, something he was very interested in doing, he was sent to become a priest. Because you became a priest, you get free education. Furthermore, the Augustinian um, order in, in the, what is today, Czech Republic were the ones who were used as a nest to generate the new teachers for the Austrian schools. So he was sent to the University of Vienna and he studied not biology, physics. In fact, one of his teachers was Christian Doppler of the Doppler effect, -da 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 -da, that kind of things that is used to measure the distance with the stars. He was extremely well prepared on mathematics, almost zero in biology. But he became a monk, he was sent to, he didn't pass by the way the teacher's examination. And um, he was sent to uh, uh, be the head of the mo this monastery, and he got so bored because he was almost an atheist, <laughs> that he decided to plan all this peace and he started to see certain correlations in the numbers of the uh, colors and the number of the, uh, the shape of the seeds. And then he published this paper in 1864 that although it was published in a well-recognized scientific journal, nobody understood because he was, a he was uh, writing on biology in the language of mathematics. What is the guy talking about? Actually, it took 36 years, the year 1900, until people recognized the importance of the Mendel's laws of heredity, which are the ones that we're using today. Then you have a German, Alfred Wegener. This was a meteorologist, pretty much unknown at his time, who one day he was looking at a globe, uh, Earth globe, and he said, all these different continents, they look like the pieces of a puzzle that have been taken apart. And he said, is that possible? So he looked at some of the evidence among fossils. And when he put all these continents together and saw the distribution of different group of fossils, he said, these, all these terrestrial animals had to be together at some point. And the only explanation for this is to have all the continents of the Earth together in something he called Pangaea. He was a meteorologist, so the geologist said, are you crazy? You have no idea what you're talking about. Continents floating, moving around in pieces? You are crazy. He published that in 1912. It took until the 1960s where geologists started to recognize that he was right. And he came out, actually, with the most important revolution in geology, which is called plate tectonics, a term that we are using now today in politics, basically saying, look how all the things can change so rapidly and so dramatically for the face of the Earth. And then we have the story about egg fertilization by humans. Is Emily Martin here, by the way? I thought she was coming, I'm sorry. The idea that we learned in textbooks many years ago, and it's somehow still out in the air, is that they have the, the female egg, and then we, macho males, produce <laughs> 300 million sperm cells. Look how macho we are. 300 equals one, in order to get there, and the fastest one and the strongest one is going to break through the membrane of the egg and then we are going to have a baby. Emily Martin, a social psychologist, I'm sorry, a social anthropologist who actually works in, in uh, Jennifer Mangles, our uh, chair of the psychology department lab, and who is right now at New York University, said, this doesn't sound right. This match of stories is like too common among too many cultures. So she started to look at the scientific evidence and actually there was no sperm 
breaking through the membrane of the egg. Then some other uh, uh, scientific evidence came and said, say, oh, but the egg actually can kill some of the sperm. And then there was all this narrative about the black widow, <laughs> the femme fatale, <laughs> killing this macho sperm there. So this is nonsense. And actually, by putting all this together, she said, hey, here we have a very ex a good example, actually, of cooperation between the egg and the sperm to make babies. So all these stereotypes about women were thrown out of the window, and with good reason. Now, these all are anecdotal uh, um, evidence that I have pr presented here. How about the actual numbers behind all this? I'm going to show you here the result on a number of studies conducted among corporations about the impact of diversity in those corporations. In our corporate world, about 22% of employees work in, for companies that have this two-dimensional diversity. It is among these companies that we find that employees at companies with 2D diversity are 75% more likely to have a marketable idea implemented. When employees in publicly traded organizations with 2D diversity are 70% more likely to see their organization capture a new market and 45% more likely to see their organization improve market share than employees in publicly traded organizations without diversity. When it comes to benefits in terms of the opinion among CEOs in this country, they said 85% believe that a large global enterprises believe that diversity is crucial to fostering innovation. 79% of companies believe that diversity incentive incentivates have more a positive effect on co company culture. And 83% that executives agree that a diverse workforce uh, uh, helps to improve the company's uh, ability to capture market. And Firms that, are, that interest themselves in uh, breaking the, uh, the glass ceiling for these uh, situations are 250% doing better in the stock market. This is data. Oops. This is what is called the diversity dividend. In companies that are gender diverse, they are 15% more likely to outperform the, 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 the competitors. And in companies that are, 35 per, uh, that are ethnic, ethnically uh, diverse, they are 35% more likely to outperform their competition. These are numbers. In fact, the most upfront companies that we have in this country in terms of innovation are the ones in the uh, technological industry. Google, Twitter, Apple, Facebook, eBay, Yahoo, LinkedIn. You can see here on the left section the percentage of white people they have versus the percentage of diverse people in here. Furthermore, Facebook announced just two days ago that they, beginning on January the 1st, 2018, they will require any company, any organization doing business with them to have at least 33% of a diverse ethnic group in there. The first one who are in panic is the, their law firm, because it's almost entirely white. And nobody wants to lose the account for Facebook. So they're rushing now to hire black lawyers and Latino lawyers for their, their organization. Then the government. We have the National Security Agency, who has a specific problems to recruit people of diverse background. And so is the CIA which has targeted actually a number of colleges and universities that are highly diverse, like ours, to do recruiting here. Not to train assassins or spies or anything like that, but analysts, people who can understand different information and come up with solutions to those, to those problems. So the question is, how are we doing in academia when it comes to diversity? We are constantly being accused of being politically correct too liberal, and all those kind of things. Well, 
Here are also some numbers. This is the latest study by the American Council on Education on the percentage of people of color who hold CEO positions in colleges and universities. In 1986, it was 8.1%, 1990, 9.6, 95, 10.7, 98, 11.3, 2001, 12.8, things seems to be going well, 2006, 13.5, and then 2011, it dropped to 12.6. They haven't published the ones for this year. I got uh, access to that, and it's going down even further. But this more amazing of this is it's going down among minority-serving institutions. So I polled some of the um, board members of the institution asking, what's going on in here? And it became apparent to me that because higher education is going through a crisis moment, they want to hire the white male with political connections that will make them survive in terms of getting money from uh, the government, uh, from the feds, et cetera, et cetera. So we are going backwards in this particular regard. The problem for, for women is also very acute. This was this uh, paper published in Science last year showing that we have different expectations for women in academia than we have for males. That every time there is a co-author paper between a male and a female in academia, the assumption is that the male was the one who actually did the work. Even the, the female appears as the first author. Not only that, this poll was conducted not among people outside academia. People inside academia think that. Other figures, 60% of all of the doctoral students that we have in this country are women. And that's a pipeline to get into academia, right? However, only 46% of assistant professors in this country are women. Something already happened there. 38% of associate professors are women. 23% are full professors. Look at that big drop between associate professors and full professors. Furthermore, in academia, women earn 10% on average less than males. Are we doing different jobs based on gender? No. Now, if some of you women are thinking that in order to avoid this problem with your salary by becoming administrators, think again. Female administrators in academia earns 20% less than the average male, which is exactly the same difference in terms of management in this country in salaries between women and men. What's going on here? This picture was taken in 1898. This is in the, uh, in the Harvard Observatory in Massachusetts. This gentleman here, his name was Edwin Pickering. He was an astronomer, a very good one. And at that time, there were no machines. So you had to use people to do the calculations. Actually, the people at that time were called computers. OK? And he had all this all-male group of people in his lab. And he said, you are doing a sloppy job. And just to tease the males, he told them, I'm, I, and I assure you that if I can fire, uh, uh, hire females, they will be doing a better job than you. And by chance, this woman here, Williamina uh, Fleming, was a maid in her house. She used to be a teacher in Scotland. Her husband abandoned her when they moved to the US. She, she had to go work as a, as a maid. And she said, no, yes, I can do it, the calculations. Not only that, she became instrumental in hiring all this group of women to do mathematical calculations. And sometimes we think mathematics is not, it's basically a male job. Well, look at this. Despite the fact that this was a great advance for women in science, and despite the fact that the first 
PhD in astronomy from Harvard were all women. In a book that has been recently published called The Glass Universe by Deva Sobel, she unearthed the um, diaries of Williamina. And she tells in that story, in that book, that when um, she said uh, to Pickens, uh, uh, why are you paying us $2,500 uh, $2, a year while you're paying your mail, the males working here, $3,500 a year? And Pickering said, oh, but that's not a bad uh, salary for a woman. So even people who were kind of advanced at that time, they still have these issues. If in terms of race, if you see, for example, according to the high education last year, 64.8% of all assistant professors in this country are white. 75.3% are associate, uh, uh, associate uh, level are white. And among the full process professors, 81.8% uh, are white. You can see the level of attrition that is happening here. Combine these numbers with what I showed you earlier for women. Now you can imagine how difficult it must be for a woman of color to become a full professor. So what's wrong with us? Although we have all this data, all this knowledge, and all this talk about political correctness, what is wrong with us? There was a, a paper published in 2007, uh, written by Robert Putman, who is in, uh, at Harvard, who came out with a really thrilling uh, information that was really scary in many ways. He concluded that in ethically diverse neighborhoods, trust even once own race is lower, altruism and community cooperation rarer, and friends are fewer. We have an issue with diversity. We have an issue with being around people who are not like us, by gender, by race, by education, you name it. And this is something that has been called implicit bias. It's defined as uh, the brain's automatic instant association of stereotypes or attitudes to our particular groups without our conscious awareness. It happens. In fact, there is a test developed in Harvard, by the way, that helps to discover your own implicit bias. And I'm very happy that working with Mona now, this test is being uh, provided to, uh, to our search committees. So, because most of people at least none of us, I, th I hope, think that you are a racist or misogynist. But we have these things in the back of our brain for some reason. So in conclusion, diversity makes organizations better. There's no question about that. But academia is a bad offender when it comes to diversity acceptance. We shouldn't be being accused of political correctness. We should be accused of hypocritical in these things. And I can tell you many stories as a person who has supervised many searches, how sometimes people who are well qualified, then the other person is the one who is chosen for that. And I always wonder, what's wrong with you? And finally, we need to be, be aware of unconscious bias uh, because it is in us. And we need to discover and realize that that's the case. I want to acknowledge here some of my colleagues in other institutions who have helped me to do this work. Dana Hansberger at Carleton College, Jennifer Mangles uh, from the psychology department here, Albert Manes, University of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, as Scotty Page, which I cannot uh, thank enough for all the interaction we have had on these issues. Jack Stoll from Duke University, Kieran Morrow, as I mentioned earlier, who initiated uh, the idea for me to give this presentation, and Mona Jack, with whom I have been working very closely in the last month. And I happen to report, because I want to finish with a good no note here, with good news. This year in Weizmann, we have hired three faculty who are African-Americans, one of them a woman, one Latina, one Middle Eastern, and one transgender. So yes, it can be done. Thank you. I've agreed to kind of direct traffic on questions and answers. 
and uh, that way Dean Romero can focus on responding to your questions. So if you have a question, please come to one of the three microphones, begin by stating your name, and uh, ask your question as clearly as you can. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Valente of the Central Office. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you. Um, thank you, Mark, for having us. Um, my question is, is there a an elitism bias, and our academic, uh, academia are too enthralled with degrees and where people receive the degrees, from which institutions they receive, and is that contribute to a lack of diversity? Absolutely. Uh, one of the issues that we are facing is where these people graduated from. When well, Ivy School must be good. Let me tell you a story about this. When I was dean at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, there were no people of color among the science departments. And I challenged the science department to tell me, if you find me someone who is doing a postdoc and happens to be a person of color, I will convince the administration to create a tenure track line for that individual. The chair of the chemistry department told me about this individual who was at the University of Oklahoma, not Yale, Columbia, Oklahoma, who was an African-American chemist. By the way, one of the African Americans that we had this year is a chemist. And these are the only two black, uh, black chemists I have ever known in my life, okay? So they brought it to me, they, he had the qualifications. Despite the department's resistance of some faculty who have been given a new faculty line just because it was a person of color, the person was hired and he won the best teacher award for that institution. So it's not about just, because most of these people didn't have the opportunity to go to an Ivy League. They didn't have a very good high school they went for. They didn't have the economic resources to do that. So you, you need to, to look past that and start to look at the individual as a much entire uh, uh, entity in terms of the potential that that person may have. Hi, uh, Cheryl Smith, Department of English. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I serve on the CUNY-wide um, advisory board for faculty affairs, and we just had a meeting on Monday, so hot off the presses. One of the things that we were discussing was both the um, both attracting and retaining diverse faculty. And an idea that was floated by some of us was, well, CUNY would be a great place for a really um, robust, postdoctoral program where we could have a, a program with a lot of prestige. People would come here, do research, do presentations, maybe a little teaching. And we have that bug in central office year, perhaps. So I would like to hear you talk about uh, how, what you think of a postdoc program in Weissman, maybe um, in the humanities. We would love to get some great postdocs in here. There are peer institutions who use these as pipelines for building a diverse faculty. I think it would be a great way for us to attract um, diverse faculty to Baruch. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. I mean, that's a little bit beyond what we do here in Baruch because we're talking about the graduate center. But I think that, that's, the, that's the place where we can start, certainly. And to do that, you need to basically work on two basic areas. One is to make sure that this place is accepting, acceptance in terms of diversity. And for that, you need the involvement of other people of color in that demonstrated that that's going to be the case. The other thing is essentially to tell people that there are programs here that will welcome that type of individuals because of their expertise will provide the type of perspectives that we don't have. And being in, the, in this, this marble city, so diverse, we should take advantage of that thing. But the thing that I have always encountered as a problem dealing with university administrators is that they don't, they don't understand the following. Diversity just won't happen. You need to put money into it. It costs money. And that's what creates many times the resistance of, oh, yeah, but where do I get the money for this? Well, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Christina? Hi, good afternoon. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I Thank you, Dean Romero. Um, the first question talked about um, the concept of elitism in hiring, especially in faculty. Could you take that to the next level of how we might incorporate opportunity hires into the process of uh, looking at people, people's degrees and academic backgrounds? And 
It could also translate to the staff levels, but this, this concept of opportunity hires, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Absolutely, that's very important. I mean, this year we lost a very excellent faculty member from the Department of Natural Sciences, uh, who is a Latina, because her husband, also a Latino, got an offer at Florida International uh, uh, University, and we couldn't counter that. So again, this goes back to the issue of money. If we really want to make this happen, we need to provide the money to make this happen. And it's not a big risk. Remember, we have a system of tenure. So we have six years to figure out whether the person will make it or not. But we should try it, and we should invest on that. So that's one of the things that we need to do. One of the institutions, you won't believe this, but one of the institutions who is the most advanced in this type of policy is the University of North Dakota. Of course, who wants to go to North Dakota? <laughs> Especially if you are a person of color. I had a friend who, um, uh, she got a job as a provost at the uh, Iowa, uh, Northern Iowa University. And she told me she was very happy. And when she communicated this to her family, her family asked her, are there any blacks in Iowa? So that's the kind of things we need to take into consideration. So yes, policy matters. And to make those policies happen to work, you need money. Another, please. Um, hi, Elsie Ron, political science. Thank you, Dean, for a wonderful uh, talk. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, participated in a faculty boot camp that was organized by the National Center for Faculty uh, Diversity and Development. I might get the name a little wrong. They also offer institutional memberships. Um, I, at the time, paid about $3,000 for a semester-long boot camp. Um, that really promotes and helps young faculty members to, to be successful. So if you are looking for new ideas, uh, maybe CUNY becoming an institutional member of this uh, amazing nonprofit that does wonderful work um, would, be, would be something for you to look into. I'm happy to provide information. Excellent. Thank you. I'm Thomas Teufel, I'm the chair of the philosophy department, and I have a science question. Uh, and the science question is this. Uh, is there any evidence, any research done uh, on the question whether our awareness of our implicit biases actually makes those implicit biases any less implicit and any less biased? In other words, does consciousness of it actually help change the problem? The evidence that exists there is that when these kind of programs and these kind of tests have been uh, implemented in some of our institutions, the number of people who are diverse in background has increased. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the best evidence that exists. And Harvard has, has shown those numbers, and uh, Yale too. Yeah, sure. Hi, Dean. Um, I have a I'm not a, a faculty member, I'm an administrator. But one of the things I've always appreciated about the, the whole discussion of diversity is to take it beyond just the diversity that we're conscious of, and that being color, race, ethnicity, and that sort of thing. But to look beyond, and I don't know if you could speak to that, but to look beyond that when looking at, say for example, uh, a, a candidate for a position. For example, you mentioned that somebody from the University of Oklahoma happened to be an African American. Maybe the issue or the reason why he was so successful is not so much that because he was an African American and may have had those experiences, but he could have come from Oklahoma, a small town where he had various experiences. And so how do you talk to that as far as considering diversity and not just limiting, limiting it to ethnicity, race, and yeah. things that we're totally used to? I think that's a very good point because, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about the inherent diversity, but also the acquired diversity that, that you have there. And let me explain to you uh, another case that I dealt with uh, in my previous institution. I had a faculty member in the Department of History who um, was the best one dealing with issues of race, particularly with African Americans. He came from a small town in Kansas and he was white. But that town was part of the exodusters who conquered that part of the, of, the, of the country where they were giving free land and all that kind of things. And 90% of the town were blacks. So he grew up in an environment where the majority were African Americans. He understood those issues very well. And despite the fact of being white, he had the background 
of dealing with the, that type of problems and situations. So yes, acquired diversity is equally important as the uh, inherited diversity. I want to thank you all for hosting this event. I'm Arlene Torres. I'm a university dean for recruitment and diversity in the central office. Um, and we have been engaged in uh, critical discussions about diversity and inclusion with the Board of Trustees, with the Council of Presidents, uh, with folks in academic affairs, uh, and the Office of Human Resources. And we have to deal with, in a sense, twins. <coughs> Uh, recruitment on the one side and retention on the other. Um, and we have had some challenges at CUNY, as many institutions have, of higher education have across the country when it comes to retention. So if you might speak a little bit to the challenges that we face at CUNY and what are the kinds of things that we can do on the ground to participate in real active approaches to maintaining the excellent that we do have. Yes, that's a very good question. It's not just about um, recruitment, but also about retention. And one of the problems that I've been facing, hiring people and uh, keeping people here in my short tenure at, at Baruch, is the lack of a spousal uh, hiring policy. People see, oh, this is just nepotism. No, look to that beyond that. Because the, the case that I mentioned earlier about a, a natural sciences professor that we lost is because we didn't have a, have a spousal. And in some of the cases of the candidates that we interviewed this year, the, the question of the spouse all, always came up. And, and so it's very difficult when you don't have such a policy to retain uh, that kind of faculty in the, the, those circumstances. So that would be one of the many steps I think we need to take right away. I'd like to add my thank you from our school for your comments today. I'm Mike Seltzer. I'm coming from uh, directly from our diversity standing committee at the Marsh School. I gather that Weissman is also instituted such a committee, which would be the second school. What would be your hopes for what school diversity committees might accomplish on their watch? Where do you see the low hanging fruit opportunities, but also some of the longer term changes that you'd like us to make? I think it's essentially uh, make of, of the issue of diversity a really college-wide issue, not just something that people talk about it, and put some teeth into that. And teeth means it's providing the policies and the resources to make this practical. I mean, the case that I mentioned of University of North Dakota is a very good one in which you say they are doing exactly that, and it's working. It's working very well. So why, why can't we do that here in New York City? Uh, so we need more, more uh, attention to both the issues of policy and uh, resources being provided for that, because otherwise that will not happen just because. Uh, thank you for your uh, speech. I just, well, my name is Mohamed. I'm currently a uh, sophomore here. I've attended Brook College with a major in finance. So the word diversity, uh, I come from in Pakistani background. So how, what advice would you give to students on campus to encourage diversity and then uh, furthermore become social agents of change? That's a very good question. And this, this is my first advice is don't get into a ghetto of yourself. Don't hang around with only people who are like you or have your very same background. Mix up with people who are from different, from different groups. One of the things that impressed me the most when I came here for the job interview, when I had this meeting with the students, which was a very diverse group of students, were two things. One is when I asked them, what do you expect from the new dean? The unanimous answer was that you hire more people who look like us. That's very important because we work for you. So you should have a, both, a voice at the table. But the other thing is, I talked to a, one of the students in that group she was the head of one of the Jewish clubs in here. And she told me that the treasurer of that club was a Muslim woman. That's the kind of example that we need to set. And for that, we need to get out of our own ghettos and start to mix around, because that's the way to really break all these barriers and break all these stereotypes. Hello, thank you. Um, I also loved your talk. I, I just wonder, uh, uh, maybe, I, maybe I disagree or, or maybe I do agree. 
how, so, so it's, it's great that you highlighted, you know, the visible parts of diversity, the sort of choice between you want to be visible or invisible, and those things that are invisible. And uh, I think to one of the questions earlier, you suggested that all of those things are equally important. And I'm wondering, at what point does it actually matter if we don't have visible diversity? Because it, it, it makes it very difficult to even get to the other things if they are equally important. So um, even in your sort of closing comments about your recent hires, you pointed out the visible diverse um, group of people that you brought in and how difficult it is at uh, a school that we can't actually first get ourselves to a place where we are visibly diverse and then also include all the other parts. Yes. Basically, my approach to that is during the interview process. You can gain a lot of insight about an individual without violating the laws when it comes to the cut, cut, cut type of questions that you shouldn't ask. And a lot of things come across. And something that I noticed in this, among these individuals was the fact that I also told them my story. I'm a first generation college graduate. I came to this country as an immigrant. I came this last time actually as a political refugee. I had to start from zero. And then they see that they can empathize with someone who is in a position of power, so to speak, who will be actually understanding their own um, difficulties that they had in life. And I think that made a lot of the difference. I mean, so with some of them are corresponding to this day, despite the fact they ha haven't started working yet here. So that is the part of the personal touch that is very important. And that's why it is important to have diverse people in position of authority, because that they can relate to all, all those people. So that's why I, I, that's something you, you need to consider and take into consideration. Let me, let me give you an example of the only time I rejected a person of color to be a faculty member. I was the chair of the biology, biology department at Arkansas State University. And one of the final candidates was an African American. And there are very few of them in biology. So we had a, an interview, we sat down, we talked about things, and suddenly he asked me, can you just pay me to do research because I really don't like teaching? <laughs> if I had just said, yes, let's go for this person because he's Afri African American, I will set him for failure. Because it, this is not, Arkansas, Arkansas State University is not a research institution. You have to teach and be good at that to survive. So that's the kind of things that you need to take into consideration to make a good decision when it comes to hiring people of color. Can I ask uh, Dr. Child to make the last question? I'm Eva Jo from the English Department. Uh, thank you, Dean Romero, for your talk on diversity. I, I wanted to bring up one other form of diversity, which is of um, subject matter in particular uh, in the science, social sciences and humanities at CUNY and I think almost everyone in the United States, the focus is Euro-American. And I just wanted you to comment on what diversity of subject matter as it might um, expand to Africa, Australia, and of course Asia. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? There was something in the oh, end. I, I wanted to, I, I said that the diversity is subject matter that um, I think all of us are aware that both CUNY and perhaps American higher education as a whole uh, concentrates on Euro-American Euro subjects. And I want to oh. ask a comment about Africa, Asia, and so on. Yeah, when, that's, a, that's a very good point, because when I have met with the department chairs who say, we would like to have another line, and we have to also increase diversity, I said, can you come up with a subject for the likely, likelihood of getting people who are diverse just by the nature of the, of the subject itself will attract more people of color to apply for that? Urban studies, <coughs> immigration issues, minority issues, that areas in which you can find a niche for people in different departments to do that kind of things. And that's a way to increase the, the, the chances of find, finding someone in that area. So that's one of the things that you need to do uh, in terms of subject matter to increase the chances of getting people of color. I've been asked to make some closing remarks, but before I do, please join me in once again thanking you.